We wish you good morning on Sunday, the 9th of August 2020, from the Butts Church in Alton, Hampshire. We trust that you will be blessed as you share with us as we come to this time of worship. Let us begin with prayer. O Lord and our God, we thank you that we can indeed come before you this day. And we just ask that you would help us not only to worship you, but also to be those who use our time wisely. We pray that you would teach us, dear Lord, to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands, we ask. And we thank you that your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, has given his disciples a prayer which we can pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And we come to sing our opening hymn today where we pray for God's light, light of the world. again and uh, hello who are you it's sunny how are you sunny hello clive i'm fine 
fine. It's been lovely and sunny. <laughs> very Lately. good. Yes, very good. Who's missing today? Well, we're missing Jacob, Jungle Joe and Jacob's family who've been helping him with the children's talk. They're having a holiday and so that's why there's no Jungle Joe this week. Oh well, we've got you though, which is lovely. And it is wonderful weather, isn't it, for holidays. Nice and sunny, just like you. <laughs> yes, we hope that everyone on holiday has a lovely time. And because we're on the computer, or church is on the computer, they can even see us when they're on holiday so they won't be missing us. Isn't that lovely? That is wonderful. And of course, one thing people like on holiday is good sunshine. And it reminds us that light is so important, isn't it? Yes. If there was only darkness, I'd be bumping into things all the time. Well, that would be disastrous and horrible. Um, the Bible tells us that God created light on the first day and also that our light, the Lord Jesus Christ, rose on the first day of the week. And he is called the light of the world. The Bible also calls, is also called a lamp to our feet and our light, a light to our path. I think that comes from the Psalms and there's a song that sometimes the children sing in church about that. Well, uh, maybe uh, they could sing it now, couldn't they? Maybe they could. I wonder if the children could think about all the different things that give them light at home. I don't know. Perhaps the light bulbs. <laughs> or the sunshine. Yeah. Or a torch. I won't say any more because I'm giving lots away. You are, yes. So, uh, well done. Thank you. So, children, do uh, have a think about what Sonny has said. So it's lovely to see you, Sonny. We hope that um, Jacob is back with us next week, don't we? Oh, yes. Although I do like seeing everybody, but um, we do like Jungle Joe too. And Jacob's so very good at the children's talk, isn't he? He's brilliant. But we pray above all that God's light, the Lord Jesus, would shine into all of our hearts. Have a good week, everyone. Yes. Going. Bye. Bye, Sonny. We now come again to a time of prayer. Let us all pray. O oh Lord our God, like Moses of old, we stand on holy ground. God the Father, we thank you for your great love shown in the glorious plan of salvation. We confess that we have strayed and gone our own way. But we thank you that you did not abandon us. Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, thank you that you have totally fulfilled your Father's plan when you gave yourself for us on the cross. Words cannot adequately express our love to you for becoming the atoning sacrifice for our sin. It is with great joy that we affirm your bodily resurrection and glorious ascension and we look forward with anticipation to your return. God the Holy Spirit, we thank you for inspiring the scriptures and for opening our minds and hearts to understand the plan of salvation and the love of God that inspired it. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, humbly we pray accept the love and devotion of our lives. And again we ask that you would be pleased to forgive us all our sin, to cleanse us with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. But we do pray today for many places and many situations, particularly for what happened in Beirut. We pray for the people of Lebanon, Lord, that you will have mercy. And for the many places which are being put back into lockdown because of COVID-19. We again pray that you would be gracious and that your loving hand would be upon us. As there are so many things 
that uh, we could pray about. Maybe for a few moments of silence, we can just bring our prayers to God. Be pleased to hear and answer all these our prayers we ask. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And now Amanda is going to bring us a reading from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 14. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In our journey in with the Apostle Paul through the letter to the Ephesians, we come today to Ephesians 5, verses 3 to 14, uh, the passage that Amanda read to us earlier. My heading for this is, God is holy, so what? The holiness of God is a strange thing to us. How can anyone fully understand how another person, another being, can be absolutely pure and spotless? And it's in every area of their being that they are perfect. It is as light and dark, extreme opposites, what we've been singing about and what Sonny shared with us. There is no statement in the Bible that is more demanding than God is holy. That is what it tells us. The gods of the world that inhabited the space around Paul and the others, at the time that uh, he wrote this letter to the Ephesians, were those who were not holy. They were not pure. They had major faults, all of them. Now, this is a tough thing to get around. Many people try and distinguish a difference in the Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is said that in the Old Testament, you get the holiness of God, uh, the lawgiver the one who says no to everything. And in the New Testament, you get the love of God revealed ex expressly in the Lord Jesus Christ in his coming into the world for us. But if you read the Bible, you will find that the biblical God is both holy and loving in one person. The inseparable unity in each person of the Trinity is that they are holy. God is holy, so what? What difference does that make to us this day? Well, he requires all who love him, all who will follow him, to conform their behaviour to his. Indeed, he requires that of every person on earth. But of course, they won't do that. Because sin has marred our ability. It has blinded us. It has caused us great problems. And we are disjointed. We try to do our best. And so many people, when they speak about these things, um, say, well, 
I expect God to be satisfied with what I have done. And that if we fall short of his requirements, I expect him to be big enough to excuse my shortcomings and to say, well, you tried your best. Well, what we're looking at today, which is a tough passage, um, this clear teaching dispels that view. We are going through in what is known as systematic Bible teaching. Although we have one-offs for uh, special occasions, we go through so we can find the line, the thread of the Bible message. And this is why the letter to the Ephesians is so brilliant. It tells us about God in the first three chapters and then in chapters four, five, six, what he expects of us and how we should live to honour him. It is easy to say, well, that is all well and good, but you don't know my situation. You don't know the problems I have, the trials I face, and surely God uh, should be satisfied with that. And you may even go, as some people do, to an extreme and say, well, the Bible teaching does not apply to my situation, as though we are greater than God. But if you are a Christian today, whatever age, you must take the Bible seriously. God has given it for our good. And so we have it in our language. And we are blessed indeed. In chapter 5, verse 1, we read that God forgave us. That is past if you're a Christian. And that should affect our present and our future conducts. All must be lived in the light of that clear statement that we have been forgiven. That is what makes Christianity so different to all the other religions of the world, where you have to do things, where you have to earn merit points. Christianity tells us that we are forgiven in Christ. We are to ex accept that wonderful gift and then to live for him. Now, as we come to our section today, uh, Paul will use verses four, uh, sorry, chapter four, verses 22 to 24 as the anchor to what he's going to unfold for us here in chapter five. Uh, in those verses we read, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in all true righteousness and holiness. Put off, change your mind, put on. And in the light of this, he grounds what he's going to say around two major things. Our present identity in Christ, in verses 3 through 7, and then in verses 8 through 14, the future judgment of Christ. How should we live in the light of that? So firstly then, in verses 3 to 7, you will see up here on the screen, because God is holy, put off worldly passions. So what has God is holy got to do with our passage today? Well, everything. Some will think I'm a dinosaur or totally out of touch with the modern world and reality and the modern way of thinking. Well, I probably am in many ways, but I believe the Bible is the word of God for people in all ages through all time, and it is the standard of life. What then is our present identity in Christ? Well, we're living in a world of spiritual darkness. We cannot know God, we cannot find him, we cannot follow him through our own efforts. So verses three and four reveals what life is like. And for many of us, we can identify this whether we're at school or at work, in our homes or out in the world, and especially the way the media confronts us almost constantly with the things written here, written here uh, sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity and coarse joking. And of course it's easy to be drawn into this way of thinking or acting or performing well, some people it is a performance when they get into the pub or whatever, they uh, lose their inhibitions and uh, put on a performance if they're not careful. Well, Christians are 
required to live differently, to repent of our sin, that we should realise that the glorious third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, is living within us, and to a greater or lesser extent, we should acknowledge him and realise he is with us. Now these are hard things that Paul is writing about here. Sexual immorality refers to unbiblical sexual intercourse. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means, unfortunately, that everyone, or the majority of people, are in trouble. Uh, Jesus once said, in Matthew 5, verse 28, in the Sermon on the Mount, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's as though you don't even need to do anything. The, uh, the object of what you are looking at doesn't know what's in your heart. And Jesus says, be very careful. Now, life in the Roman world is often portrayed as being totally licentious. But there are those who did have standards and did not conform to every practice or vice that was on offer. Uh, you may get through certain programmes and films a wrong view of the Roman world. Not everybody indulged in fleshly pursuits. But if you visit the site of Ephesus today, one is taken how close brothels were to the main thoroughfare and how easy it would have been to avail yourself of them if you were that way inclined. It was more difficult to resist when your friends and others uh, were visiting such places, I'm sure. But Paul, though, is dropping a spiritual and moral bomb. Only a couple of days ago, we remembered the awful events around Hiroshima with the dropping of the atomic bomb, and today is the anniversary of the dropping of the bomb on Nagasaki. Well, Paul is dropping a spiritual bomb here. He says, realise who you are. Live differently. Don't just go with the crowd. God has created us sexual beings, but we are to use his gift his way. A great warning is then given in verses 5 through 7. Those who do such things will not inherit God's kingdom. Surely it can't be that serious. Well, according to the Bible, it is. Are we easily taken in? Well, don't be deceived. God's wrath awaits the disobedient. Don't enter into partnership with the disobedient, as verse 7 says. Now, I don't know if ever you've uh, indulged in um, picking the petals off a flower. Don't think of the things that are listed here like a flower. The petals are pulled off. And you recite, or may not recite, he loves me, he loves me not. And all you end up with is a barren flower, head and no real reason or answer to your question. Am I loved or not? It's very foolish, really. Well, we can't do that with this here. I like this one, I don't like that one. And uh, we need to take on board everything that God gives us. We've recently had our car MOT'd, and it's like an MOT when a vehicle has to pass a series of checks and requirements to be deemed road worthy. Well, Christian, are we Christian worthy? Is our life worthy to bear the title? Do we know that God is with us? This passage, along with others in the New Testament, is like a checklist. And he goes on here, he's given us another little list, saying, are we sexually immoral, impure, greedy, obscene? Do we use foolish talk or coarse joking? Well, consider them soberly and carefully. Are we, as he lists here, an idolater, immoral, impure and greedy? Isn't it interesting that he uses greed more than once? Because greed is such a problem. We are prone to covetousness. Uh, to desire what we don't have is an unholy desire and to seek things that God hasn't given to us. Maybe we could read these things often, slowly and carefully. 
we need to pay serious attention to what Paul is saying here today. And we all need the enabling of God the Holy Spirit to live to God's glory and to, to realise that he is holy and we must be holy as well. Ephesus today is a ruin, the ancient city, because a very long time ago the harbour was silted up and so nothing would come, no trade, nothing, and the city was abandoned. I wonder, is that a picture of ourselves? Are we silted up with sin? And so the life of God doesn't flow within us. So we find that Paul says this powerful thing. But then God is holy, so what? Well, illumination brings clarity. We see it here in verses um, 8 to 13. I think I'm this side, aren't I? Uh, living in darkness, whether it's physical, moral or spiritual, is very difficult. But we are to live as children of light, verse 8. The darkness as listed should no longer be the realm in which we live. But as Jesus is the light of the world, and as Christian believers, we are called to be children of light, to spread his light and love everywhere. We have to be different for Jesus' sake, not just to be what some people used to call when I was growing up, Holy Joes. No, every one of us is to be holy. Because God's light will eventually expose everything. We are told here about the return of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring time to an end and to bring judgment. And we find that at that time we will get questions answered. Now, whether or not we're still interested in it, um, we will probably get answered where COVID-19 originated. How did it come to be? Or you may think this is rather foolish, but as we're almost at the anniversary, for me, who was Jack the Ripper? Who pro produced such awful events and uh, effects in the Victorian world? Well, that may not be that important to many. But we are told here that everything in life will be exposed and be seen for what it is, even shady deals. Those things done in darkness, those things where no one is at present aware of it, will be brought to light. So do not get involved in them right now, friends. Do not have God show you up. Don't steal. Don't cause trouble for others. Always be mindful that he is with us. It says in verse 8, you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. That is what we should be. And then there's another little list that should be true of us. We should have the fruit of light within our lives, all goodness, righteousness and truth. And righteousness means morally upright. So morally, people can trust us. All these things that are listed, are they true of us? Well, we cannot change the past, so we leave everything in the past, but we can make a fresh start by giving our lives to the Lord Jesus, or giving it again to the Lord Jesus. Maybe we've slipped and we're embarrassed. Well, come to him and ask him to bless us. Do we delight in these things? goodness, righteousness and truth? Do we seek them and do we avoid the deeds of darkness? It is a matter of our wills, of course, and also of our minds. That's why he said there in chapter 4, be changed in your mind, in the way you think. Think Godward, not earthward. Are we properly focused? Now, I used to be a structural engineering draftsman. I am bored some of you with that many times. But one of the things I often did was go to survey buildings to measure them up, then produce drawings so people could enact the changes that were required. One building I went to, and I've never 
forgotten it, obviously, many long years ago now, have been badly damaged by fire. If ever you have the misfortune to be in a building that has been damaged by fire, you will know how devastating it is and how dark it is. It's quite incredible. Well, I was walking around on an upper floor, taking measurements of columns and beams and where the staircase needs to go, uh, when a structural engineer who was with me reached out and grabbed me on the shoulder and pulled me back forcibly. What were you doing? I asked. And he said, Clive, if you walked another pace, you would have disappeared down that hole that you couldn't see. You would have gone six stories down, ended up in the concrete basement, and I obviously wouldn't be here today. He had saved me from that which I could not see. Because everything was so dark. And that is the trouble when we live as people of darkness. We cannot see the danger we are in. Another one I went to survey many years later was a disused restaurant. And uh, it was an incredible experience to, to go in. I don't know how long the building had been uh, disused, but uh, I went in and the first thing that hit me was the smell. And then as I went round, there was all the old cooking fat all over the wall and there was debris and old food and everything. It was absolutely disgusting. The stench lingered on us. So when I got home eventually, I had to take off my suit. Um, I then had to take it to the dry cleaners, took off all my other clothes. I had to have a shower, put on fresh clothes uh, because... The awful stench lingered on me. And I wonder, spiritually, are, are we like that? Do we walk in darkness? And do we have an awful odour, a bad odour about us? We may think we are being funny when we tell uh, nasty jokes or take the mick out of other people. We need to be very careful because it's like a stench on us. And people will avoid us and what we do. Are we? Are we nice people to know? And so it is here that we find that action is required. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, Paul writes. It is wrong to even mention them in verse 11. Uh, in case you wonder why there's a a little stop then is because my screen went all dark and I wasn't sure if I was still recording. So easy, isn't it, when the darkness comes to lose sense of proportion and place. We may be in a daydream spiritually, mentally or physically, but we need to wake up. Rise for Christ will shine on us. How can we do this? Well, verse 10 is very clear. Find out what pleases the Lord. What does please God? Well, look at his word and go through what he tells us. God is holy. So what? Well, so what is because we need to know that and live our lives in the light of it. God is completely pure and free from evil. As a result, it is impossible for sinners to live in God's presence until they have been made clean until they have been illuminated through the work of God, the Holy Spirit, in their lives. God's grace covers all the sin of those who trust in Jesus. Have we looked to him and his finished work on the cross for us? Because our understanding and conformity to God and his requirements means that we realise that life is far greater than we can ever imagine. It has greater possibilities than we often give it credit for. But it also prepares us for what lies beyond death, an entrance into God's eternal, holy, perfect, pure presence forevermore. And life in eternity will be experienced with new bodies that will exist for God's glory and reflect perfectly his holiness. We will be able to see, hear, touch, speak and taste. Eternal life will be bigger, better, more beautiful and more real than anything we can at present imagine. 
God is holy. So what? I trust you realise that we have to answer that and to find where we are today. May God be pleased to bless us all. And our concluding hymn this morning is the great hymn which speaks about God being holy, holy, holy. Holy is God the Father, holy is God the Son, holy is God the Holy Spirit. You may like to stand, if you can, wherever you are, and join us in singing. And so we thank you for that uh, hymn of praise and we just close with prayer. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May you, he bring you home rejoicing once again and eventually into his glorious presence. For his wonderful namesake we ask it. Amen. Well, it's lovely to have seen you. We trust you will be able to join us at 6.30 this evening when Ben will be leading our discussion. And it's uh, a time when we can together get to grips with what the Bible teaches. God bless you. <laughs>